you I, see, I was going to talk about that too. About, yeah, I was going to say the good thing about uh, you know the, the race to the bottom is what they call it, where you know, and basically they're never going to stop either in America until they have labor camps and prisoners working in them for free, because that is their goal. That is the goal. But uh, we have the power of unions. And this is the time to get back in touch with all of them. We can have worldwide unions. Well, and, and how, how do you bring the unions back? Because the reality is it's, they're under 20% in the public and private sector. And you, you've got profits and dividends up largely because wages are down. According to UC Berkeley, all income growth in the U.S. last year went to the wealthiest 10% of households. 93% went to the wealthiest 1%. Whoa. You even have a quote from J.P. Morgan Chase Chief Investment Officer Michael Cambalist. He wrote, U.S. labor compensation is now at a 50-year low relative to company sales and GDP. Uh, American workers have lost all of their bargaining power. And Harold Meyerson from The Post writes, because of this, quote, employers can serenely blow employees off, and judging by the data, that's exactly what employers are doing. So what would you do to give workers back their bargaining power? And it took 40 years to get here. How, how would you get us out, Roseanne? Well, I'm glad to say it here in San Francisco, the home of Harvey Milk, who was an idol of mine. And um, I would do exactly as Harvey Milk suggested, to make a coalition between various groups, uh, all who can be in agreement of at least one thing. And uh, that would be labor and, um, you know, uh, the Greens. And um, to encourage people to stand together and actually strike and actually not cross picket lines and actually do the things that are necessary to get people back their power. But also, I don't just want to stop there, I want to say, we need a new kind of stock market. I can't like, you know, I gotta just say these things too. We need a new kind of stock market. And I do have a plan for that if you'll read my uh, materials. I do have a plan for a new stock market that is based not on war and death and the sale of weapons and these other things, but actually on greening communities. Who can do it the fastest for these rich gamblers that use all our money in their casinos? Man, they could make 10 times the money they're making, and I appeal to their greed. They can make 10 times, they can be the, the bigger pigs than they are. Ah! And everybody else could get richer too if they would just do the right thing for the right reason at the right time. We'd have a booming stock market. Uh, I think, you know, it's important to see that over the past couple decades, it's been the policies adopted by both Republican and Democratic administrations that have undermined the rights of unions to unionize and made it harder for workers to form and keep unions. And there are many things that can be done. Uh, recently, the Obama administration approved the uh, Federal Aviation uh, Administration, the FAA reauthorization which made it further uh, difficult for unions in transportation industries to be formed. Uh, likewise, the Obama administration, or I should say the, the president, abandoned his promise as a candidate to support the Employee Free Choice Act, which would make it much easier to form unions. And under my administration, that will again be a high priority. We also need to go back to the so-called free trade agreements, uh, which, you know, signed under Clinton and extended just uh, in the recent weeks by President Obama, who then uh, extended the free trade agreement to Colombia, a union-destroying country, which creates an even greater race to the bottom between American workers uh, and, and workers overseas. So, you know, I think above all, we need people in the White House uh, as well as in all levels of government who are committed to working people and who will uphold and increase the minimum wage and the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers who are, who are treated as subhuman, I guess, for getting a sub-minimum wage, uh, and uh, to renegotiate the free trade agreement, agreement so that they are fair trade agreements, uh, not free <laughs> tax system. There are so many articles out about the corporations that don't pay taxes at the national and local levels. Jill. You know, I, I think we need to go back to the drawing boards on, on the whole tax system and start to make it fair and equitable. 
uh, including in cor corporate taxes, so that you know we need to maintain the corporate tax rate, not lower it like Barack Obama is advocating, uh, along with the Republicans. We also need to co to close corporate loopholes. We need to tax corporate ta corporate shelters overseas as well, because there are hundreds of billions of dollars for yeah. tax and uh, corporate tax havens. But in addition, we need to start taxing capital gains like income. That's what, that's what money really is. And while uh, the president's Buffett rule, you know, a minimum tax on millionaires, is a good idea, that is just scraping the surface of what needs to be done. So we need a truly graduated income tax that increases at higher levels of income in many steps and particularly to start taxing capital gains. Um, and also, we need to start taxing Wall Street transactions. Well, I'm thinking about how to wrap my mind around uh, saying that, I'll, I'll answering this question, but, um, and I hope I answer it uh, satisfactorily, but I think about like the biggest heist in the history of the world that went on in this country and nothing's done about that. And I really think that instead of skipping over it, we ought to really take a big, real nice look at uh, the transfer of wealth upward and what that meant and how they did it. And also we should prosecute every single one of them and retrieve our money. And we do have laws that would allow that, but yet for some reason, I guess maybe, you know, who knows what they say the president do all we have to like what who knows i mean you could have all the ethics in the world but once you get in there like uh, who knows what happens what kind of warnings they give you about getting in line to wall street to serve wall street interests but i think that we can together stand up against wall street and that's why i'm thrilled by the occupy movement and everything that it signifies because everything filthy and disgusting originates right there on wall street and we don't want it we want to be done with it we want fairness we want laws and we want our money back thank you <laughs> Forgiving student debt. Absolutely. Which has hit the trillion dollar mark. It's more than credit card debt. And you know what they're doing? I'm, I'm probably out of line. But this makes me mad because a lot of people have told me, well, they, they can't pay, not only can they not pay their student loan back, but their mom or dad, you know, their family put the house up for their for their loan, so they're losing their house too, and that's put on the student also. So they're like there there is like let's not be blind. Let's look at what is really, really going on in our country. They are locking everything down. Uh, and also, just as a side note, this isn't getting much media attention, but 12 California state students are on hunger strike because of increasing tuition fees, student debt, and budget cuts. Uh, let's talk about foreign policy now. Oh, did you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, just one other thing about student debt. What's really uh, disturbing. I mean, in, in addition to it being a trillion dollars more than credit card debt, as you mentioned, you know, students are essentially subsidizing through high tuitions tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires, which have been protected while students have absorbed these incredible cuts, almost a billion dollars in cuts since 2008 in California to the public higher education system. And while students are getting hit now, it's been a 300% increase in tuition for students over the last, since 02, I think, in this state. At the same time, we're seeing uh, salaries for the uh, executives, for the CEOs of the universities, go up and up and up to the $250 and $350 range. And those salaries are being increased as the students are receiving uh, t tuition hikes. So this is absolutely unacceptable. Yeah. You both believe in bringing the troops home and shutting down military bases around the globe, right? Okay. Yeah. So according to this website, this is an incredible website you should all check out. It's called militaryindustrialcomplex.com. And according to this site, they track all the contracts that are handed out on a daily basis. And it's amazing to, to, to look at this with absolutely no scrutiny. 46 publicly reported contracts were handed out last week for a total of almost $3 billion. This is one week. And yet this really gets covered. 
almost 202 million on Friday and almost 852 million on Thursday. And they do parse it out, so they'll say Lockheed Martin, Boeing. Uh, it's just fascinating to look at. So, since you're both on the same page about that, what role do you think the U.S. military should play in the United States and abroad? Roseanne. Uh, as peacemakers, as, uh, you know, protectors of human rights, uh, of uh, everything that is right and good in the world, uh, the protection of women to be educated, uh, the uh, cessation of torture and uh, indefinite detention all over the world. I think that we should stand for our, our values and uh, and go there and set people straight non-violently. I would, uh, if I were president, I would begin to, I would use our uh, military to really start getting the food to the hungry people all over the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I second the motion on all that and would add that uh, the, the guiding force in our foreign policy needs to shift from the flexing of military muscles and the securing of uh, energy and other resources instead to uh, the upholding of international law and human rights, which should be uh, the guiding force in our foreign policy across the board. And it's not only uh, that we're spending an enormous amount of money in the military, but increasingly it's the military-industrial security complex. And military is becoming securitized, and our domestic uh, police forces are becoming militarized. So we need to start shifting the money from this military-industrial security complex to domestic uses. During the Second World War, we transformed car factories into bomber factories. It's time to transform the bomber factories into wind tower, solar, and solar factories. going on, we would need five hours to really talk about what's happening, but well, how about an open-ended question to both of you? What concerns you most about U.S. foreign policy, and what would you, what would you like to change? What's at the top of your list, Jill? I guess, you know, I'd like to change the whole ball of wax, and, and instead of having over a thousand bases in over 140 countries around the world, we need to bring those men and women home and the war dollars home and use them here uh, and stop being, I think it's not really the policeman of the world, it's sort of the exploiter of the world, yeah. the guys of the world. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> well, you, you, for example, have Israel and Palestine on your website. Yeah. That's one of your top issues. So maybe you want to address that. Well, I could address that, but what was the question? Just what's it, in terms of what you would like to see changed in U.S. foreign policy, what's at the top of your list? Well, I think that, you know, the Green Party says it best that, you know, if we were not, like, willing to sell our souls for oil to drive big honking cars around and go nowhere, and instead we uh, created green communities, sustainable communities where you didn't, you could ride your bike to work and create wealth, that would really be good, and maybe the military could help with that. But it's also called the prison military industrial complex, and I want to say that because privatizing prisons and then locking up citizens, that's going to be the new jobs they give to Americans is holding a gun on your neighbor while that neighbor does uh, free labor for corporations. So it's so screwed that, you know, we're going to have to completely stop and start over again from the bottom to the bottom. I did want to ask about Israel-Palestine. As I say about Israel-Palestine, and because I'm a Jew, uh, I'm a Jewish woman, and uh, I know you are too. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, yes, and uh, I think we understand from our background, the Green Party people, that almost every single uh, problem in the world, when you break it down, is an underlying, has an underlying labor issue attached to it. So that's how I think we would solve everything there and every place else. You've got to pay your labor force 
a living wage, and uh, then they have got to have decent places to live and decent food to eat. And were that to happen, there wouldn't be any need for any military, any wars at all, anyway. Yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I got a lot of other things to say, but I know I don't have time. Okay. Uh, and, and Don Belcher is going to come up in just a minute to ask about a healthcare question. But first, let's talk about the environment. Uh, James Hansen, director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, had a damning piece in Thursday's New York Times called Game Over for the Climate. He writes, President Obama speaks of a planet in peril, but he does not provide the leadership needed to change the world's course. Our leaders must speak candidly to the public, which yearns for open, honest discussion. The science of the situation is clear. We cannot wait any longer to avoid the worst and be judged immoral by coming generations. So, again, a big question, but how would you deal with climate change and what we're dealing with? I mean, if we keep eating the fish that we're eating, by the year 2050, no more fish in the ocean. That's just one uh, example. So, when it comes to the environment and climate change, what is at the top of your list, Rosanna? Well, uh, getting your protein from nuts and, uh, <laughs> instead of animals. And the cruelty that that brings with it is just horrific and, uh, you know, uh, that's kind of at the top of a total reorganization of what value means and how we ascertain what is valuable to us from the bottom to the top and back down again. Um, you know, uh, gee, I have so much to say there. Uh, you know, some way I, I want to say also, this is going to be a bummer, but you know, it, we may have already crossed the time where there was anything we could do. And I just want to say that because people don't like to hear it, but it, it is true, and a lot of people do say it's true that, you know, we, we cannot go past 50 years. The most conservative uh, ecological scientists are saying we, we aren't going to make it past 50 years if we even go, even if we were to start now. It's, there's a possibility that we wouldn't make it and that all of our big dreams for a different kind of government won't matter at all. But what I just like to say is part of being green and, and efficient and, uh, you know, and sustainable is it doesn't matter if we get paid to do it. We're going to have to take it within our own hands and do it anyway. And we have to survive by helping each other, by making networks, even if we're not getting paid, even if we're not making money, we still have to do it because we have to survive and we have to put our heads to the fact that there may be food shortages, there, there may be no water. These things are coming to America, and I believe they're coming after the next election. I think they're playing with us to put it off the things they have planned for us, mass arrests and all other kinds of things of the homeless and people and the unemployed. I'm telling you that we've got to get another plan that works and that is not money dependent and, and, and is resource based. We need barter and we need it now. I, I want to add to uh, what, what Roseanne just said and also to uh, Jim Hansen's criticism of the president. He, he's not only, you know, not walking the walk, and, and he is to some degree talking the talk, but he is not only not walking the walk, well actually he's walking the walk in the wrong direction, is what he's doing. <laughs> and he's basically become the drill baby drill president who has essentially embraced the bad positions of the of the Bush administration and then gone much further not only uh, not only what he's doing on nuclear power in terms of the environment in general but also you know more mountaintop removal opening up more off offshore oil drilling as well as uh, wilderness areas for fossil fuel exploration uh, and getting the green light to fracking and so on. So what this president is doing is exactly the wrong thing. He also sabotaged the climate accord. So it was not only what he has failed to do himself, but that he has actually undermined uh, the international agreements, which are absolutely essential. And this is why when people say, you know, oh, I'm afraid of voting my values and, and voting green in this next election, it's really important to wake them up yes. that uh, Supreme Court, you know, isn't going to make the difference here, that the climate clock is ticking, and we need to not just vote with our feet, we also need to vote with our vote to live green and vote green starting now. And on day one 
of my administration, if I were honored to serve, I would, one, clean house, clean house in the White House and get out Michael Taylor and the likes of Monsanto uh, and Tom Vilsack, who have enormous uh, influence in high places. We would deny the Keystone Pipeline on day one. <laughs> hundreds of thousands, if not millions of jobs the next day by undertaking a weatherization program of every home, school, business, and public building in the country. And we would instruct the USDA to start prioritizing sustainable local agriculture, family farms, and community-supported agriculture, not only your business, we would also instruct the EPA to start actually protecting the environment yeah. and human health. Yeah. And that means saying no to fracking, to the expansion of fossil fuels, no to any more mountaintop removal. And that's it for Starlink. <laughs> getting a hold of the microphone to win more of the American public over this uh, position to get the insurance companies out of health care and to have a great health care program for everybody, like the other, all the other industrialized nations. So how will you use, my question is, how will you use your campaign to win more millions of people over to the position that we need a national health care system minus the insurance companies or it's Medicare for all or single payer in those terms? How will you use your campaign to get up those millions of people. Well, I, I really and truly believe that we're the American people giving, given the facts and the correct data in a plain spoken way that didn't come from insurance company lawyers, they would easily ascertain what is happening to them. And already they don't like it anyway. And uh, you know, so maybe we'd have to change some wording and call it, you know, maybe call it peopleism or something to remove the curse of uh, all, all the uh, stuff that the right has put on the words universal single payer health care. Or maybe we wouldn't. But definitely we could just go out and like present the facts and the cost. And uh, also I'd like to say that there, there is data that proves that uh, single payer universal health care would be way more cheaper, like would we be way cheaper, and again, appealing to the greed of um, our corporate masters, the fact that they could maybe be you know, even richer if they would do the right thing that had common sense to it. And I would make that my goal to talk about you know, how things can be done more efficiently and cheaper and make the rich even richer. <laughs> and also with that I want to say, and uh, of course to pay their fair share of taxes after they get richer, and I think their fair share is about 90% actually. <laughs> I think all we really need to do is repeal everything that happened since Reagan was elected. <laughs> you know, and then and then uh, renegotiate all the First Nation nations tribes with this government. And uh, I'll just add to that. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I'll add to that that actually polls, in fact, show that the American public already supports single payer Medicare for all. we would have Medicare for all right now. So, I, you know, I think the name of the game is how we get this is by removing the, um, the politicians who are standing in the way. That's right. Is how we get Medicare for all. 
Yeah, I, I myself got into this as a medical doctor uh, by training and by profession for many years. And people ask me, what kind of medicine are you practicing now? I say political medicine because it's the mother of all illnesses. Yeah. in order to fix all those other things that are broken and pathological. And I realized in my own development, you know, as, as an advocate, the healthcare system was broken. I thought you could just go talk to your legislator and maybe they might listen. But, you know, I learned they listen if you come with cash in hand, basically, and that we actually had to reform the political system. And that's what a political party is all about. It's about getting to critical mass so that we can actually do that. And in terms of, like, what are we going to do in the campaign, in my view, the campaign is all about informing and empowering those 50 million people who don't have health care, the 30 million students who are basically indentured servants and swamped in debt, the 18 million homeowners who've either been thrown out already or are underwater and at risk. It's about us all getting together and realizing that together we are a force which is unstoppable and we can move forward right now by standing up and insisting like the people in Tahrir Square did, uh, hold on to your hat and don't, don't undersell yourself for what we can accomplish in this, in this election. sure you write them on a card and we will be picking them up. I want to ask you both about the war on women. Um, according to the, the Guttmacher Institute, in the first three months of this year, 45 legislatures around the country introduced 944 bills related to reproductive health and reproductive rights. Half of these provisions would restrict abortion access. So far, 75 abortion restrictions have been approved by at least one legislative chamber. Nine have been enacted. We're seeing uh, requirements that would make women seeking an abortion to undergo an ultrasound, limiting access to medication, and prohibiting abortion at a specific point in gestation. Uh, it's been fascinating to watch the Democrats really not respond to this, other than to say how horrible the Republicans are for introducing these bills. So what is your response to the onslaught of anti-choice legislation? And how do you, well, how would you kind of bring the women's movement together? Because it is so closely tied to the Democratic Party. Joe. Yes, and I mean, in fact, traditionally it has been, which is why this new grassroots organization that's emerged basically uh, through Facebook called Women Unite Against Women is really uh, a very exciting development. And it's as if the women's movement has just woken up again. Um, I was actually at a demonstration in um, uh, Columbia, South Carolina about two weeks ago uh, that was held by Women Unite Against the War Against Women. And, you know, in the past I've run for office many times and it used to be if you showed up for a rally it was, oh, thank you for coming, but we can't have you speak because that would be partisan. But in this race, it's like, you know, the, the rebellion is in full swing now and including out there in the women's movement, and in that event, like just about every other event I've been to in the last several months, it's not just come to the, our rally, but it's like headline our rally and tell it like it is and let the American people know that they don't have to put up with this, that we actually have choices. So it was really um, uh, wonderful to me to see that this national network of women is emerging and that they were really happy to have a green there standing up and saying what we need to do for women's health and for women's economic security. Um, and that this, uh, this sellout that the Democrats and Obama have done, pretending that it's a choice between religion and, uh, and, and reproductive health is outrageous because what they basically did was yield, concede on the principle and say that religion trumped trumped women's health, but in fact, it was the religion of the employer trumping the religion of the employee. It was your boss, your boss's religion telling you, maybe your religion as an employee was that you need to take good care of your family and not have more children than you can take care of. So this was a real conflating of, 
uh, workers' rights and women's right to health care and, and to full reproductive rights with uh, labor justice issues. And we would stand up on that and not yield. And we wouldn't take Plan B off the shelf like President Obama also did in yielding to the religious right as well. And the real solution here is to have a Medicare for all system that doesn't separate out your reproductive health from the rest of you. We come as a package and we need to be cared for. In our entire life, we have a right to help you. Well, there's just, I agree with everything you said. Uh, there's just so much here, I can't even begin to tackle it in two minutes. Um, it makes me mad, though, to hear that the Democrat, to hear the Democratic Party given any credit that I don't think they deserve at all. Um, when they, like seriously, when they uh, chose Barack Obama over Hillary Clinton, they purged the feminists from the Democratic Party, yeah. which created a backlash which brought us to Palin. So, you know, F them. <laughs> I'm saying right now, patriarchy needs to go. It's obsolete and all the politics around it are ridiculous, hateful, obsolete. It's a bully state and it's a rape state too. And women were not just targeted for not having any reproductive rights, but their right to education and their right to their own wealth and to own homes is under attack. You know why? Because it's just easier. It's as, e it's as easy as taking candy from a baby for these guys. And they thought not even two seconds about it. They go where the money is and they take it. And they at the same time introduce a thing called peasant insurance. So not only is the employer deciding what he, what he wants to do with your body, if he wants to stick something up your vagina, he's got all the rights in the world because the laws are written for the predators in this country. But, uh, and, and they have been purposely rewritten for the predators. And uh, you know, it is to take women down from, you know, to dumb down and mind control women and remove our rights our rights and everything else that they can get away from us because they get paid when we lose it. And that's how this system, that is how this system works and how people at the top profit by thieving and robbing women and children, widows and orphans, and uh, pocketing into private hands public money. So not only is this all happening to women, but women are also bearing the brunt of the pleasure and the privilege of having that done to them. They're bearing the cost of it too. And it makes me very angry. And, and to add to that, we need to resurrect the Equal Rights Amendment. Absolutely. To sure yes. that women have equal pay, equal work, so that we put an end to this incredible disparity in poverty where the poverty rate among women is twice that uh, among the general population. 40% of single mothers are in poverty and women are getting 77 cents on the dollar that man is earning. So we need to make that history and uh, get the ER uh, Equal Rights Amendment passed. I didn't get to complete my thought there, but I was going to say, it's so crazy how uh, power is co coalesced in about 1,252 hands of individuals in this country, billionaires around the world, that decide everything. But when they, give them, when they gave themselves the right to collect insurance when their employees die, called peasant insurance, they insured a whole class of baby boomer women, and they get paid every time one of us checks out from the various uh, poisons that were fed daily. <coughs> so, I mean, they're working both sides of the street. They're getting paid coming and going. Your death is their goal. Power. This forum is being broadcast online, and I know that a lot of people are watching because I checked in even at 2 o'clock and there were 30 people online just looking at the marquee outside. So I, I'd like you to speak, before I get to the cards, I, I'd like you to speak directly to the marginalized and ignored communities in this country. I'm glad you mentioned the word poverty, Jill. In the 20, a 2008 election, through all the debates, the word poverty wasn't even brought up by John McCain and Barack Obama. Uh, to spe specifically speak to the poor, people with disabilities and the homeless, um, tomorrow's Mother's Day, and I just don't want us to forget about all the homeless moms and the homeless families because there are so many and they really don't have a voice in this country. The latest census data shows that about one in two Americans, this is really hard to believe, they're either poor or low income. That's almost half of the country. 
Uh, again, the Democrats and the Republicans, I'm sure we'll talk about middle class, middle class, middle class, even though the middle class are now falling into poverty. So what would you say to people who are struggling and really hanging on by a thread? I would say that I will be your president. I, everything I do will be for equanimity, for redress, for justice, for nemesis, <laughs> for a, a decent place for all of us to live with no slavery yes. and no usury yeah. and no war profiteering. I will never lie and I will never betray the working people, the poor people, the people of need, the voiceless people in this country and the world. That's why I'm running because uh, I, I I'm able to uh, speak for people from whom I came from. And I'll fight hard too, believe me. I have, I have balls bigger than anybody. And I'll say exactly what needs to be said right to the face of the person that needs to hear it. And I'll do it wisely and compassionately too. for our students who are up to their eyeballs in debt. When they say there's no money, what they really mean is there's no money for you because there's trillions of dollars that are being squandered every year in wars, Wall Street bailouts, and tax breaks for the wealthy. So in this election, we want you to know that there is money for you, and let's get together and make sure that it is redistributed back to you because it has been stolen from you. Jessica is the student president of Santa Rosa Junior College and founder and president of Students for Sustainable Communities. Thank you. So my question revolves around the Kyoto Protocol, which expires this year. And I'd like to throw out, how do we unite and bring international actors together to address climate change? What's the next step once the Kyoto expires? Yeah, I mean, I think it's time to call, uh, to reconvene the Durban Climate Conference that this president disrupted uh, last year and basically sent countries back home without having achieved a climate accord. And what they decided was, oh, we'll wait until 2020 but if you're following the science at all, if you're looking out the window and watching the weather at all, you know that we don't have time to wait until 2020. So yeah, I mean, I think we need to reconvene and establish an international accord, and I think we need to lead in the right direction by adopting a real climate strategy for this country. And that means nothing less than a Manhattan Project, a Marshall Plan for emergently greening our economy, uh, creating those 25 million jobs which will essentially accomplish that, and let's start to go carbon neutral ourselves as quickly as possible, hopefully within the next 10 years, and then we have a real moral authority to actually galvanize the rest of the world to do the same. Well, 
I know that where the people lead, leaders will follow. If our voices get loud enough and we're informed enough and we are organized enough, we, we can fix everything real quickly and real cheaply. And um, I, th I think that the more we know that, the faster we're going to get there. And I think, like I said before, we need to stop, admit that none of this stuff worked. It never will work. It's set up and fixed so it doesn't work. Yeah. We need to look at this whole system, and I, I would like to say, man, we shouldn't even call it the United States of America. It should be called the, the Electoral College. And we need to start there yeah. and be able to elect our, our presidents and our representatives. And I think that by putting Greens in every single branch of every kind of office from coast to coast, from school board on up, in the next election, which should be our goal, we're going to see a lot of things change. When people step up to their responsibility, including all of the people here, step up to your responsibility and, uh, you know, make your voices heard uh, that we don't want to live this way. We want to stop and start over with a system that is functional for the many and not the few. Yeah. Yeah. Party, a viable national party. I also wanted to know what's your strategy for growing the party, especially at the grassroots level. There are 133 green office holders across the country. How will you make the party relevant? And another audience question, how will you break through the wall the media has erected to keep out third party voices? Roseanne? Um, well, I'll go on all the TV shows. That's <laughs> what I'll, I'll do. And, um, you know, I, I will, to the best of my ability and to my own moral character and internal moral compass, I will represent the Green Party as a party of uh, the new, the new, the actual new Democratic Party that uh, will remember the values that uh, the Democratic Party has totally forgotten. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about single payer. We'll talk about the 10 key values. We'll talk about sustainability. We'll talk about permaculture. We'll talk about agriculture. We'll talk about small business. We'll talk about the things that are important to Americans, the things that were hijacked and pirated and stolen from us. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just keep it out there. And uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, I suppose I, I hope I answered that. Did I answer that? Yes, I announced on the Jay Leno show okay. that I was running for president, but I also, uh, I first announced that I was running for president in 1998. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've been talking about it at first, uh, kind of in a satirical way, but it, it, after a while it was like, this is serious. Well, and, and also, I, I Googled Google your name tonight, and you are getting a lot of media coverage. So you do have an opportunity to really get this message out. I, I was just waiting, you know, because, uh, you know, you, you don't want to spend all your capital in May when you, you know, you know, you've got a long time. I mean, they start the elections four years ahead. And you're, no wonder it costs a billion dollars to lose. And as, as I say, you know, it's all media time. Well, I, you know, I can kind of go on shows and talk about it. But the, but, but the bad part of it is that, you know, the, the way they spin a story. And I, I have like tried to be really careful about going on things. I don't want it to become, a, you know, one of their, ha ha, you guys, well, I don't want to add to uh, the Green Party get any derision or anything like that. So, like, it's dead serious, and the message is dead serious. And, uh, you know, this, we'll, keep, we'll just keep refining it, refining the words, because everything is strung together with words, and it, I believe me, it can be taken apart with words, too, and we'll keep refining the message. And when it's right, yeah, I will. Let Joe ask a question. Joe? Great, great, great. Um, yeah, in answer to the first part of your question, how, you know, how will this campaign help grow the Green Party? And I think you said, is the Green Party a national electoral force? And I would say yes, definitely. 
I mean, it is the one national, non-corporate electoral force out there, which means it is the only real electoral force out there. the cup is 10% empty or it's 90% full, depending on how you look at it. And yes, the Green Party is a small party. Uh, it is not overflowing in money. Uh, we are people-powered and a, uh, uh, a low-budget operation. But what we do is absolutely incredible. We have not yet missed a single ballot access deadline or threshold. That is very much thanks to this incredible culture of empowerment that uh, is alive and well in our state chapters all over the country. And what our campaign has been doing is helping those chapters revive, doing, um, you know, helping, helping people get through the trauma, the political trauma of what we've lived through, where we've been fear campaigned and smear campaigned over the past 10 years. And, but compare us to all the other progressive, non-corporate parties out there. We are the only ones that have survived to live and fight another day. And, and at this time, the national need is so uh, staggering. You know, I just thank my lucky stars that people have been there fighting the fight and holding the fort. We've been ahead of the curve for decades, but suddenly the curve has caught up to us with a vengeance, uh, and people are ready for what we've been talking about and developing for a long time. So it's an exciting, incredibly exciting opportunity. And if I could just add real quickly uh, about the media and the question of how do we break through on the media. And, um, you know, I think it's great for uh, Roseanne to be able to get on uh, the shows. But I would add to that, in addition, that what we have is really not a functioning press. We have an O press and a D press and a D press. And in fact, the alternative to that O press now is basically the press that they used in Tower Square and in Tunisia, which is basically the internet and Facebook and social media. That is how we are going to get to critical mass if you start putting together the millions and millions of people whose lives literally depend on what we are and what we alone are offering, you start getting very quickly up there in numbers. You've got to be at 15% in order to get into the big corporate debates. I've debated Mitt Romney before in 2002 and was declared the only adult in the room. <laughs> If they haven't admitted us into the debates, uh, we fully intend to be out in front live streaming the debates in real time and really answering the questions and going viral and ensuring that in this election we, uh, we blow the top off of this repressive political system and actually get the word out about the real democracy that we can be. Another member of the audience, Jella Biafra, who is a former candidate. Nice to meet you. How do you do? Okay. I think my top question that kind of got answered by Jill just now, which was uh, should there be a Green Party candidate for president at all when the only momentum this party has is that for local offices where we actually win from time to time? So I guess you've answered that as being well, You want to answer more specifically? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, before entering this race, um, I myself was very focused on local politics and on developing the Green Party. The first time I ran for office, I was the best candidate I ever was because all I did was run for office. I didn't know that if you wanted anything to come out of your race, you also had to build a party while you did it. So when that first race was over, I was really glad about how I did 
but there wasn't a whole new party to show for it. In every race I ran after that, and there were about five of them, uh, I really ran in order to build the party, and I ran to help develop the locals and the state chapter, uh, and to recruit other candidates. And I was running usually headliner campaigns, but what we found was that by running those headliner campaigns, we got the word out about the alternative party that we desperately need, that there is one, and about the solutions that we, that we actually deserve and can achieve and are, can afford and are within our reach. And it totally transformed the party, and over the course of 10 years, we went from being a very small and rather marginal party to where in our most recent race, we came within 200 votes of actually winning a seat in the Massachusetts legislature, and we had all the endorsements of all the progressive groups that usually vote Democratic, because we completely changed the public perception of what the party was about. So I realized that if we did that at the state level, we could also do that at the national level, and that that clock is ticking, we don't have time to spare. We need to do it now nationally because we can't afford to sit this one out while we plunge over the cliff and do this. Thank you. Okay, tempting though it may be to go into some of my own pet ones, you might know this, whether or not the California Green Party still has on a state platform enacting not just a 90% but a maximum wage. I would say, well, originally I would say 100 grand, well, up to 200 grand, you could live pretty good. Or the bailout money, the stimulus money should have gone straight to the people with the mortgages on the condition they pay it all back to the banks, the banks are <coughs> money anyway. Or that Obama is looking to approve Keystone XL in 2013, <coughs> but even if he doesn't, Canada's going to go full speed ahead with the tar sands. And whatnot. Anyway, yeah, let's go to that one because that relates to this question as well. This is a two part question. If you're actually elected, how would you deal with a predominantly hostile Congress? And considering everybody from Canada to China is, you know, determined to go ahead with tar sands and so much coal dust from Chinese factories, I have to wipe it off the windshield of my car, which is in a garage periodically in this town. How do you deal with the big bad world out there once you get outside our green bubble? Basically. Um, well, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to respond to the question about is the Green Party a national party and all that, but you know, I'll say that for another time another time. Um, I think, I think it's, I just want to say that I think it's really important that we're, uh, we be very succinct and careful with the message that we send forth, that we take more votes from Romney than we do from Obama. And, um, and uh, I think that's imperative that people know that about us. I don't, otherwise, I don't think that we will broaden our base. So I wanted to say that. Um, and uh, how I would handle things, um, I would just talk intelligently and calmly to the people involved. I want to toot my horn a little bit and say that I, and I alone, convinced uh, a whole gaggle of uh, Republican and conservative television executives that it was indeed a good idea to introduce gay characters on television during the family hour. I, I, I did a lot more than that too, and I, you know, I, I, but I, the fact is that uh, speaking directly to people in an intelligent manner with data and fact is how I would do everything. And also I would be able to search and hire a much better and higher class of advisors. Yeah. So once again, I think just common sense could, will fix it, everything. When, when everything's out in the open and people think they're going to be exposed for being corrupt, I think they change very quickly. So uh, first question about how to deal with a uh, hostile Congress. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, 
the Green Party, the Green Rainbow Party in Massachusetts, has been struggling with that at, at the state level as well, although we haven't been in positions of power, but even from the outside, we have been grappling with, with this. And uh, I have to say that there are some really good strategies out there. And to summarize, what I would say is that the president should not simply be the, quote, commander-in-chief. The president should be the organizer-in-chief and ensure that the public is informed and empowered to be weighing in in real time about the bills that are actually coming up. Because if the public were in charge, we would be passing our entire agenda. can go on prime time, you know, TV if the president wants. The president has plenty of access to email and Twitter and uh, web postings and the internet and the press. Hard for the press to lock out the president. The president can be blowing the whistle on the waste, fraud, and abuse in Congress and actually promoting the bills that need to be passed. Uh, the president can basically serve as a moveon.org that moves on from the Democratic Party. <laughs> and serve to actually uh, push the agenda that we need. And in terms of dealing with the big bad world out there, you know, I would say same strategies apply. And, you know, it's the same sort of 1% against the 99% all around the world. And if we prevailed as the 99% here, there's just no doubt that we could make the same thing happen all over the globe. Yeah. And, and on, on that note, a, a question from the audience. Do you support the Occupy movement? And as summer is upon us, the movement is getting ready to really get back into the streets. And I, I think we're gonna see major crackdowns because we actually did a show about the militarization of police forces. So how do you think the movement should respond to that and what is really in your mind effective activism, Joe? Yes, uh, you know, I think that the uh, brutal suppression of the Occupy movement and the violation of our free speech rights, our right to protest uh, and to uh, demonstrate for redress of grievances you know, is really a threat to not just the Occupy movement, to us all, and we all need to be mobilizing in this race and uh, out in the streets to ensure that we protect our constitutional rights and we not give a pass to this president who has actually been leading the charge against our constitutional rights on in indefinite detentions, on the assassination of U.S. citizens and their children, for that, for that matter, uh, and the criminalization of protest. Uh, in terms of, of approaching the Occupy movement, I've probably been to 25 Occupy sites, at least, I would say. In every state that I've been to, in every, con in every city, I uh, made a point of going to the Occupy movement and not asking for their vote, but telling them that I'm there to support them. And that has invariably created a wonderful conversation and connections and support from individuals who are there. I don't think Occupy has a process uh, for endorsing candidates, which is as it should be, because they are certainly uh, you know, very much in the target hairs of the corporate political parties, so they do need to be very guarded. But what I find is that when our campaign shows up, they get, and I'm sure this is true for Roseanne as well, they get that we are an entirely different kind of animal, that we are not predatory politics as usual. Throughout the history of social movements, it's always been the collaboration of social movements together with independent electoral parties independent political parties, the Liberty Party during abolition, the Women's Party for the women's uh, right to vote, the Socialist, Labor, and Progressive Parties for the right to unionize and 40-hour work week and safe workplaces. It's always been this collaboration that has made history and small parties help articulate the agenda, uh, the solutions, and put those demands, force and drive those demands into broader public discourse because as Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, it never will. That is what our party and that is what our campaigns are all about, is moving those demands, those solutions 
into the public dialogue so that they take on a life of their own and they will be unstoppable. So we remind the Occupy movement, be out there and vote with your feet, but also vote with your vote. Don't raise the white flag of surrender over the vote. The Occupy movement. First, about the Occupy movement, uh, that I hope it, it I hope that it doesn't get co-opted by MoveOn.org, uh, which we call MoveIn.org for the Democratic Party and for the benefit of uh, re-electing Barack Obama. I, I think that it is unstoppable because it mutates, like all good things that make any kind of common sense. They have to mutate uh, according to the environment around them. And, uh, you know, I think that the people of the Occupy movement at the top know that they can't do what they've already done because of, because of what's happened with the police and how, you know, everybody's going to get a payoff when somebody goes to prison now. So I think they are going to be smart, and I want to bring this up that on May 18th is a thing called a hashtag laugh riot. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be great that they are doing creative and new things uh, that aren't, like, on the usual grid of um, social <coughs> protest and social movements. But there's going to be on May 18th, and I'm very excited about it, being a comedian. And I say the only serious comedian in this presidential race. <laughs> this laugh riot day and it's going to be so cool because everybody's going to be encouraged to laugh this government and all other governments to scorn and I think it's going to be great and dance the night away and just have joy and fun and all the other things that are so abhorrent to the people with their feet on our necks. <laughs> charge. What is your position on capital punishment? Here in California, we are going to vote to overturn the death penalty in November. I got sidetracked there. I'm sorry. Oh, so what's your position on capital punishment? Uh, capital punishment, well, you know, uh, I know that the Green Party is against it, so I represent the Green Party. And I gave up all my talk about using the guillotine on, on, on unrepentant billionaires who won't pay the money back. I know what I'm saying. Because the Green Party did not like that, so I no longer support the guillotine and uh, immoral bankers who cause all of those problems, including Paul Singer and Walter Campbell. I don't, I no longer support that. But I'll tell you, but I'll tell you what, I'm glad you asked about the war on drugs because that is the tip of the spear. And that is like exactly why I say, and I, because I put so much thought into this and as have other people, that legalizing marijuana will take the tip of the spear right to the heart of that beast. And the war on drugs must end. People are being, you know, that's where racial profiling comes from. Yes. That's where privatized prison labor comes from. Yes. That's where racism on the street of New York that are, arrests teenagers for having a joint, teen, especially African American teenagers yes. and Latino uh, teenagers here. Uh, this is how they have brought fascism to our country is through their war on yes. drugs. And, it, you know, it's easily overturned, and uh, in California, I, I just really think getting it, ballot access and getting these things on the ballot is the way we can fight back, and we do have big, big weapons. Yes! Agree with all that. Um, absolutely. The war on drugs needs to be uh, called to a screeching halt. The, um, uh, the issue of drug use needs to be treated as a mental health and public health problem, not as a criminal issue. Yeah. And 
and in fact, marijuana is a drug which is dangerous because it's illegal. It's not illegal because it's dangerous. And as uh, Roseanne said, you legalize marijuana and you pull the rug right out from under the whole criminal enterprise of under, underground drug violence. So And NAFTA. <laughs> and um, while, we're on, while we're on the subject, along with legalizing marijuana, we of course need to legalize hemp because it is a critical resource for agriculture, for nutrition, for manufacturing. Henry Ford was making automobiles out of hemp. We need to, and, and I would add for biofuels potentially as well. So uh, this is a very important resource. And again, on day one, what this president would do, if I had the honor of serving, would be to instruct the Food and Drug Administration to actually use science in the listing of drugs and decide whether or not they're scheduled drugs. Because if science is used, marijuana and hemp will not be listed or scheduled substances, period. Uh, agree um, uh, on, on the issue of, of indefinite detentions, I think you, you raised, Rose, did you, Rose, did you raise that in passing about how would you fight that? Right, and yeah. putting people in prison without charge. Yes, exactly. That the, the part of this violation of our civil liberties being codified under President Obama, uh, he, he now, and all future presidents now, have the power to basically uh, throw you in jail without ever accusing you of a crime no. or trying you before a jury uh, simply because the president uh, doesn't like what you're doing and thinks that you're an enemy of the state and is not obliged to defend that. So, you know. Like in the words of uh, Martin Niemöller, uh, the famous uh, Protestant minister who was imprisoned in uh, Nazi war camps, uh, you know, in his words, first they came for the communists, but I was not a communist, so I said nothing. Then they came for the gypsies, but I wasn't a gypsy, so I didn't say anything. Then they came for the homosexuals, I wasn't a homosexual, etc. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak. So, you know, and he in fact was you know, jailed under the Nazis, although he lived to tell the tale. But, um, you know, it, it does underscore why we cannot take the abuses of our civil liberties for granted. And I would raise that also with your friends and colleagues who are hand-wringing about, oh, do we dare risk the Supreme Court appointments by actually standing up for what we need in this election now and sending a real message that we need to take our democracy back. To see that uh, so many people are working on repealing NDAA, I think that's fantastic. I think we'll get it done too. And um, we have just a couple minutes before closing thoughts, but we haven't touched on immigration, and this is really important, especially because more people have been deported under Obama than Bush. What is your immigration policy? What would you do in regard to amnesty, employer sanctions, family reunification, and, and guest worker programs? Well, you know. You know, I think it's a big, big subject, and um, of course, like, you know, I used to have some jokes about it saying Mexicans sneaking into what used to be their country. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's huge, and uh, it needs, like, like everything else, a huge overhaul from top to bottom. But, you know, they say now that uh, a lot of people aren't sneaking into the United States too much anymore since there are no jobs here. And they say maybe Americans, maybe that wall is to keep us in. And they say maybe we'll be scaling it to get to the jobs in Mexico. So, you know, I just think you got to look at all angles for that. But yes, the people who live and work here deserve our respect uh, for getting the, you know, for doing the jobs that actually make this country go. And, um, and I want to say, I don't know where the rich would be without the working poor, but they definitely owe them thanks and a respect and, and equal rights under the law, and not as we have now. Yes. And uh, I would just add to that, and, and well said, Roseanne, um, that uh, 
we need to call a halt to this president's policies, misnamed secure communities. It's basically a deportation and racial profiling program. It is currently optional for communities to adopt if they want it, but it's going to be mandatory in 2014 as decided by this White House administration. So this is another reason why people need to step up to the plate and actually start voting their values instead of allowing both the Democratic and Republican parties to slide uh, into demagoguery around immigration. Um, and I would add that uh, we are all immigrants on this bus, with a few exceptions. The Native Americans, who were the original settlers, and then the African American slaves, who didn't have much choice about coming here. But with, with those exceptions, the rest of us are all immigrants, so we need to begin respecting, uh, valuing, and, and appreciating the immigrant members who diversify and enrich our communities and our economy. Uh, and we need to create a welcoming legal path to citizenship, period. We also need to go back to the source of the immigration, quote, problem. When you have large migrations of people who've been forced to flee their communities because they've been put out of business, that is a problem, and the source of that problem is called NAFTA. Negotiate NAFTA like the Colombia Trade Agreement and ensure that we have fair trade agreements, not free for corporation trade agreements. And, and speaking of Native Americans, the UN just finished a two week fact finding trip to Indian reservations and concluded that the US government should give back stolen land. Yeah. I just want to say this quickly, is that it, it, my, one of my first acts as president would uh, be to go to Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and Rosebud Indian Reservation and advise them as to what they can do about legal, reversing legal immigration. <laughs> disagree on who goes first, but <laughs> I have so much respect for you, and, um, you know, listening to you is wonderful. Everything you say, I, I, you know, I, I totally agree with, uh, and, and I'm proud to sit here beside you. Uh, I, I just, uh, I, I'd like to talk to you further about what we can do to get a broader base of this party, right. and how we can... You know, and one of those things that I, I might be taking too much time to be But um, I, I thought, well, for people who want to vote for Obama, and there are a lot of people who want to vote for Obama because they think, you know, what for whatever reason. But what I think is that um, for those people, if they could just leave the Democratic Party and, and, and register as Greens, they would still vote for Obama, but you would be sending the Democratic Party itself a message that right. it needs to hear. Right. I think this is another point of agreement that we, we agree that we don't disagree. And, and I would just add that, uh, yeah, I mean, when people say to me, what do you think about Roseanne running, running in this race? I say, I think we need more celebrities and people of means and reputation to be following in Roseanne's footsteps. About statement and maybe you can include some comments about how to really broaden this space. And just one comment from another audience member, uh, the non-adversarial way the two of you have interacted with each other and the cooperation you have demonstrated makes me proud to be a Green. Please talk about how this can move the country forward. So, Jill, why don't you start? Great, yeah, so um, I, I think this is uh, this is a staggering moment, 
and it's a wonderful campaign within the Green Party where the candidates uh, really collaborate uh, as Roseanne and I are here today. We're really modeling what our political system ought to look like and including that we all women. And, you know, I think one of the ways, well, seems to me the biggest way that we uh, actually enlarge the party and enlarge this campaign uh, is by paying attention uh, to a famous quote, which was that the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing they have it to start with. That was Alice Walker who said that. And I think there are so many people out there right now who are really hurting for what we have to offer on stopping home foreclosures, on providing health care as a human right, on providing employment as a human economic right so that everyone has a job, a living wage, community-based job that makes our communities healthier, uh, stopping the wars and, and bringing our war budget home. Uh, you know, this is a win-win for the American people. A lot of people have been afraid to stand up and vote for it, afraid to stand up as Greens, afraid to actually break away from the establishment parties, and that didn't happen by coincidence. You know, this has been the product of a fear campaign that has been just drumbeat, uh, drummed into the American public, certainly for the past decade, intensively since the 2000 election, but even before then. And I think it's a really incredible opportunity right now to point people to the record and what has come of this politics of fear, this feeling that you got to vote for the lesser evil or something terrible will happen. We've seen after 10 years where people bought into that lock, stock, and barrel that silence is not an effective political strategy. Survive, survive. <laughs> that the politics of fear, in fact, has brought us everything that we were afraid of and to be quiet in order to avoid. We've gotten it in spades. So I think how we make the party, in fact, bigger is by, number one, reaching out to your contacts, your networks, get on Facebook, get on the internet, get the word out, let's go viral. I would encourage you to go to my website uh, jillstein.org. If you sign up to be a volunteer, you'll get the newsletter. The newsletter is substantive. It's about the issues. It's about Bradley Manning. It's about jobs. Uh, it's about uh, the ending the drone warfare. You know, it's, it's the stuff that people are concerned about and talking about. You can use that letter to get the word out. Uh, you know, I think this race is just a staggering opportunity to turn a breaking point into a tipping point yeah. and to take back our democracy <laughs> and the peaceful, just, clean future we deserve. So let's make it happen and let's do it together. I urge you to go to my website uh, and we can be a powerful, unstoppable force together. Thank you. Cooperation instead of competition is a staggering and revolutionary thought for American people. And uh, we, just, we want to model that and we want to live that way. And we want to actually live our actual lives uh, according to our actual beliefs. We don't want such a large gap between what we say and what we do. And I think that's how we can create a viable party because we live the 10 key values in our, in our personal lives, in our business dealings, in our communities, in our families. The, the thing that I'm very encouraged about is that women are now 53% not only of the population, which is staggering when you think that we receive only 17% of the representation for that, but we're also 53% of the workforce and the staggering positive uh, implications of that have, have just started to be felt and I think they'll be felt more in this party uh, with two women 
you know, it's just emblematic in, in every single way. And, uh, and our greatest weapon is um, to resist the fear that they force feed us, the mind control of fear that controls women. All we have to do is just be present to each other, discuss things in a civil manner, and be love. And, and I think that's all we really have to do. I think failure is impossible. Uh, and then the Green Party will choose its nominee at its July 12th convention in Baltimore. And I just got a note from Jello, and he says, President Obama will win California anyway, so vote Green. Yeah!
December to the